All right, everyone. Uh, looks like Robin is here, so we'll begin. Uh, welcome to the STOA. Uh, today we have Robin Dunbar joining us today. And um, according to his uh, Wikipedia profile, uh, Robin is an anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist and a specialist in primate behavior, uh, currently head of the Social and Evolutionary Neuroscience Research Group in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. Uh, and he's a guy known for the Dunbar's number, uh, the cognitive limit to the number of individuals with whom any person can maintain stable relationships. Um, and very excited to have Robin uh, here with us today. Uh, how today is going to work, uh, I will take in Robin in a moment and, and we'll, him and I will have a, an exchange. And then if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat. Um, have like a Q or question before your, your question. I'll call on you. I'm Mutant Self. You can ask your question to Robin. And um, yeah, we're here for about 60 minutes in total. So that being said, uh, Robin, welcome to the STOA. Ah, great. Lovely to be here, virtually. Yeah. Um, so I thought maybe it would be prudent to like the, maybe the first couple of questions, just get a sense of, of your work and the Dunbar's number if people haven't, um, you know, not aware of it. And uh, I know your, uh, um, your research involves social bonding and primates and humans in particular. And a lot of your recent publications are like, I'm just geeking out about them, like friendshipology and stuff like that. Um, so I'm curious what maybe the through line of your work is and how you got attracted to it. Oh, um, this was a sort of inevitably, as is quite often the case with people in science, I suspect, is a whole series of serendipitous uh, accidents that eventually ended up with me um, having started out as somebody who actually went to university to study philosophy. Um, but uh, fortunately or otherwise, um, I went to Oxford University as an undergraduate and Oxford doesn't do philosophy on its own. So I had to do it something else. And I chose psychology as the least bad option. Um, I don't know that I could even spell the word, never mind know what it actually entailed when, when I went there. But I've always um, pondered since that had I gone anywhere else as an undergraduate, all my other applications were for pure philosophy which I realized was far too difficult a subject for mere mortals like myself. And uh, I would have ended up as a rather bad secondhand car salesman in some seaside town, I suspect. So psychology turned me from being <clears throat> a, a died in the wool humanities person into a scientist. <laughs> Great credit to it. And um, I, I drifted off to um, study monkeys in Africa uh, after that for about 25 years and then because funding was short in the kind of particularly in the uh, early 90s I um, switched to studying humans instead and because we've been interested in how primate social systems work uh, what their dynamics are and so on uh, I it was sort of was an easy step to start thinking about this in humans and, and as a result of that um, uh, I came up with, in effect, what was Dunbar's number. The intermediate step was, was making a prediction um, off the back of the size of social groups in monkeys and apes, as it, how it related to the size of their brains and wondering what number you would get if you put human brains into this equation um, for, for primates. And the number came up around about 150. So I set about looking to see if this could be possibly true and uh, having found lots of evidence for it essentially, um, then kind of made me sort of think, well, how does this work? I mean, we would kind of have, have an understanding now of how primate societies work. How does this translate across to humans? What are the extra bits that have come into play in humans since we parted company with our great ape cousins, as it were, several million years ago. Um, what are the additional things that have come into play that have allowed us to produce these enormous mega communities that we now live in? And, uh, all the kind of cultural uh, side bits that spin off that, like uh, novels and poetry, <laughs> ideas, and dare I say it, even science. 
And are you surprised how, um, you know, people about, beyond your discipline have, have taken to the Dunbar's number that's been popularized in books like Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point and a lot of people in kind of the spaces that we run here in the STOA talk about it often. So I'm curious what you think of the legacy of that uh, number is. Um, it, yeah, I, it really has spread. Um, I'm told if you Google it on uh, uh, Google, you get, I don't know, 26 million hits or something in, in that order, um, uh, which kind of means it's spreading out into the wider world. So these things, you know, if you look at any ideas in science, or I guess any ideas in any discipline, you know, um, be it philosophy or um, even be it, I suppose, you know, you see it in the histories of religion, they all start out very small. It takes them a long time for the ideas to spread into the wider community. So they reckon in, in the kind of sociology of science that it takes about a decade before your colleagues uh, accept uh, a new idea and then about 30 years before the wider world hears about it and comes to accept it, by which time, of course, your colleagues have decided it's all rubbish anyway, probably. But <laughs> which is a kind of an interesting reflection in this case because it, it, it's there are constant attempts to demolish it um, which kind of always bemuse me because they're nearly always completely off at a tangent uh, which is kind of irrelevant <laughs> but there we go you know yeah yeah, and so if you, um, we're going to pivot to the Q&A uh, soon so if anyone has questions to start putting them in the chat and that was going to be my next question um, so I think right after we booked this session, I think New York Times released a sensational title like Dunbar's number debunked, uh, referencing a paper in the, I think it was biology letters. Yeah. Um, is that something that you you have any thoughts on or you'd like to address? Um, well, I, th I think the bottom line is the paper's rubbish and I'm just gobsmacked that it ever got through the um, review process. I, I, the irony of it is that the day before that paper came out, we published a massive paper in a journal called Biology, Biological Reviews, which is about four times the impact factor of uh, biology letters, which I've published in many times before, um, which ex actually, ironically explains why <laughs> this uh, debunking paper is just completely wrong. I mean, they've uh, not understood the statistics they use. And they've not really understood how primate or human social systems do. And I think this is perhaps because, well, uh, P Patrick Lindenfors, the, the senior author on it, seems to have me constantly in his sights for reasons that I don't un uh, understand. Um, uh, but the, his collaborators, I think, are sociologists. And so they have a sociologist view of um, society, uh, human society in particular, that you know, human societies are completely different to the societies of, of all animals, including monkeys and apes. And the answer is they are, but they're not in, I mean, their argument is, you know, they differ from monkeys and apes because it's all down to culture. And the answer is, well, yes, that's kind of true at one level, but at another level, and that's the level at which Dunbar's number actually works. Um, it's not, you know, we use the same mechanisms. We use the same bits of the brain as monkeys and apes do, it turns out, um, uh, to manage our relationships. Um, all the things that define and constrain and dictate the social systems, the small scale social systems of monkeys and apes um, also define and dictate uh, uh, and constrain uh, the world, the social world, the everyday social world in which we live. And, and you know, that when, when I say in which we live, that includes, you know, the office, um, the shop where you work, or the school where you work, or the hospital where you work. Those, that scale of, of society, so it, you know, the more intimate scale is really driven by these. Of course, what we've done is find ways to exploit these same mechanisms, actually, it turns out but exploit them on a grander scale. They, some of them scale up extremely well. Some of them are unique to humans, but we may come around to discussing which ones are and which ones aren't and uh, the mechanisms we use in social bonding. Um, but sitting at the base of it is very, very primate based mechanisms. So the neurophysiology of it is straight, you know, it's 40 million years old. 
So I, I, I mean, I, you know, it's kind of amusing sometimes uh, various attempts that have been, this is by no means the first, um, to debunk. There's two different ideas, really. One is the social brain hypothesis, the relationship between social group size and brain size and primates, and indeed other species. Um, uh, and Dunbar's number is such applying to humans. But the problem with this particular paper is it's 30 years out of date. Um, it would have been interesting 30 years ago, but it's completely ignored 30 years of research that's refined and um, mined and developed and uh, made much more complex, this whole area, including the original social brain hypothesis. So it'll, I'm afraid it's not dead yet. Um, you know, it, 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 would, it would save me an awful lot of interviews if it had died. <laughs> um, so you heard it here at the STOA, Dunbar thinks the paper is rubbish, the recent one on uh, it being uh, um, deconstructed. And perhaps, I, believe, uh, I believe the word bonkers was the word I used to the New York Times. <laughs> Cool, cool. Um, so perhaps we can get into some of that in, with the Q&A. Um, yeah, I'll take an Evan in a moment and just one or two follow-ups uh, um, and then we'll move to the next person. So Evan, you are up next, my friend. Thanks. So um, I'm curious. So in your book um, on uh, grooming, gossiping and the, and the evolution of language, you argue, I think that at least in some part evolution, uh, language evolved as a way to perform this sort of social grooming that allows for tight group coordination that say in other primates like chimps or bonobos takes a much more literal physical form and is thus quite inefficient with respect to time. So uh, language you say evolved for the purpose of, you know, sort of like virtual grooming and those are my words, but I think that's the basic, um, you know, argument there. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the interaction of things like digital social networks, because it seems that at least once in the past, according to your hypothesis, at least, we've sort of replaced a more physicalized and time-consuming and direct um, form of social grooming and social coordination technology with a more virtualized or abstract one and the move from physical grooming to language. And so I'm curious about the changes that are happening now in our societies and specifically uh, I'm directly curious about whether you think that um, digital social technologies in some form or another may allow for um, tight coordination in groups larger than the, the classical Dunbar number size or any other place you want to take that question. Yep okay um, uh, well this could keep us going for about the next four hours probably <laughs> but the the I mean Perhaps the place to start is just to remind uh, everybody that when we say refer to the Dunbar number, really it's a series of numbers. It's actually a series. Okay, we, I mean that originally we didn't know this. You know, back in 1992, 93, when the first two key papers were published on this, we thought uh, it was just a single number and that was it. It was the kind of typical community size in small scale societies. It's kind of the number of people. Um, uh, as Peter mentioned at the beginning, uh, the number of people you can have meaningful relationships with at any one time. Um, but it's, it turned out fairly soon after that, we realized that actually this number 150 is made up of a series of layers uh, uh, of increasing kind of emotional quality, but decreasing size as they come in towards. So I always describe as being a bit like, you know, if you chuck a a stone in a pond, you've got these ripples going out. And if you think of yourself as the stone, you're surrounded by a series of layers of friendship, which the innermost ones are very small, but they're kind of big, um, big ripples, <laughs> big waves. And as you go further out, so the, 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 the size of the ripple gets bigger, but it's kind of height decreases gradually until it, it disappears into the, into the lake, if you like. Um, but then we discovered that actually these layers extend beyond 150, and, and we now know there are layers at 500, 1500, and 5000. 5000 appears to be the absolute limit because it defines, and that wasn't us that discovered that, it was some psychophysics guys quite recently. It's defined by the number of people whom you would recognize, whose photograph you would recognize as a stranger or not, that you've seen them before or, or you have never seen them before. Um, uh, within that, the 1500 really is the number of, sometimes defines the number of faces you can put names to. 
Um, you know, so I guess, you know, for all of us, for the better or for worse, you know, Donald Trump would be in there. <laughs> You'd recognize him instantly if you saw him. Doesn't mean to say he's a friend of yours. This is just purely a recognition thing. So the problem is, you know, well, what's actually interesting is the these layers have a very discrete scaling pattern. Each layer is three times the size of the layer inside it. The, num the layers count cumulatively. So uh, everybody in, in the layer below is part of your 150, as it were. Um, um, you, you know, the difference between the layer at 50 and the layer at 150 is not 150 new people. It's 100 new people plus the more important people in, in, the, in the layer at 50. And these, these layers turn out to be present in the societies exactly the same numbers uh, of uh, monkeys and apes and even elephant and dolphin and species like that that have multi-level social systems. And you can actually see them also in the distribution of group sizes in monkeys and apes as a whole. So they, they all have this fractal structure. Um, and and for, there's something odd about these particular numbers, these particular layers, as it were, that makes them very stable. Um, uh, in, individuals are less likely to join and they're less likely to leave, if you like. Um, uh, it doesn't mean to say groups don't change in size, but the primate groups are uh, kind of changing constantly uh, by the, almost by the day as animals are born and animals die or leave or what have you, um, is that they're trying to target somehow these numbers, if you like, or at least the wrong way of putting it probably philosophically, um, it's more that when they, you know, they're, they're trying to get onto these uh, um, attractor numbers, sizes, because they're more stable um, uh, uh, and they, as they drift away, you know, the, the thing starts to fall apart, so they lose individuals and they come back. Um, now, the, the problem is about social bonding, how you maintain that, and, and, and that is done by primates by social grooming, that's what does it. It, it triggers the endorphin system in, in the brain, so it's a pharmacological platform. But for primates, they have a kind of cognitive, this very strong cognitive element, which is where the social brain story comes in. So this is all about understanding the nature of your relationships. Well, what we've done, I don't know, I, I should add that the problem with grooming for them as it is for us, and we still do it, uh, we tend to call it petting and stroking and hugging and caressing and stuff, but it's still the same activity. It still triggers the endorphin system in the brain. There's a limit on the number of people you can do that with, and that limit is at about 50. Uh, beyond that, you need something else to hold the group together. And this is where the kind of behavioral mechanisms, most of which are cultural in origin, that humans kind of evolved come into play. Uh, and most of those are language based um, because they, they, you know, things like storytelling and religion and or the rituals of religion and, and singing and, and, and the like. Um, but also the, running parallel to that is what we call the seven pillars of friendship, which are kind of like a supermarket barcode you have, which identify you as a member of community. They're all language based, or at least they require language to explain them. So, and, and, you know, one of those seven pillars is your dialect, places you in a community instantly to anybody who knows, or at least, at the very least, I know you're not in my community because your dialect is different to mine, right? So I can place you sort of right in the center of my little social world or not. So language becomes important. And I have to say, originally I thought language was just about kind of a way of, you know, what you actually said was kind of trivial and irrelevant. Um, which is obviously why the British talk about the weather all the time, um, famously. Um, it was just that what you were doing is kind of making a statement of commitment. You know, I'd rather be here talking to you than down the road talking to Jim. Right? And, and in that sense, it was a kind of formal uh, virtual grooming in, uh, or informal virtual grooming in the sense that I wasn't actually physically doing anything, but uh, I, I was declaring an interest in you. But it, it, it subsequently, it's turned out that what we actually say is quite important. And I always describe it as kind of really like the totem pole in the center of the village green. You know, it identifies who we are as a community 
um, and uh, we can all hang our hats on it and say, yeah, we belong. You know, I, I, I know who you are. As long as you, you hang your hat on the, on the same totem pole, I, I don't need to ask anymore. I just know who you are and, and I know we can engage. So um, all these kind of cultural things that we engage in, so sense of humor, um, uh, religious and political views, moral views, um, the things we, our hobbies and interests, all these kind of things are part of the seven pillars and they ident demarcate a community, they, you know, at, at the kind of nation state level. Uh, well, what's then interesting is these were designed for small scale communities, but they scale up unbelievably well some better than others. I mean, religion, the rituals of religion, religion generally, which is one of one part of one of the pillars, scales up it hugely, I mean, you know, on the sort of mega uh, community size, as, as we well know. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, you know, they, 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 you know, the kind of things we do at nation state level to establish, you know, well, we are Canadians, we are not Americans. <laughs> <laughs> different down there we do you know uh, uh have have certain kinds of beliefs of, uh, and certain kinds of um ways of doing stuff which is different to to these other guys um uh, and you know every nation state you know has those they're part of their kind of history their, their kind of internal culture it's what they teach the kids you know it's what a lot of their rituals are about you know, pledging the allegiance every morning at school in the US, you know, all these kind of little rituals that do, these are the things that enable these massive mega communities that we call nation states to hang together. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're superstructures built up on fundamental underpinnings that are operate at the level of the individual and are designed to um, well, small scale communities together. So it's a very long winded explanation, I'm afraid, which probably went to many places you didn't want to go to. But <laughs> really, it's I, this is kind of the fun of this whole area is actually it, it, it's so complicated. Uh, it's kind of difficult not to talk about everything at the same time. You know, it's like kind of standing next to a car and saying, How does it work? Well, where do you want to begin? You know. So a quick follow up, um, still regarding the sort of social technology aspect of this. Um, another of the, the uh, guests on the STOA in the past has talked about a phenomenon that he believes exists where by a sort of um, Dunbar slot, I think, as he calls it. So like at a given level of this fractal organizational structure, you know, <clears throat> the, the 50, the 150, whatever, um, that, that a given like slot that might normally um, in a sort of evolutionary environment have gone to a representation of a physical human being goes to a representation of sort of like a more abstract entity, like a brand or like sure. a, a, a yeah. nation state itself. So I'm, I'm just curious about your thoughts on this sort of like, can these sort of Dunbar slots, if that's even a thing, be taken up by, you know, like an egregore or something like that, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the answer is yes, exactly. I think that's the whole point. And that's because these later human inventions, particularly at the cultural level, were designed to create a sense of belonging uh, out of what were effectively strangers. So once you're beyond the 150 layer, which is really the people you can have meaningful relationships with you at the, with at the personal level, people beyond that, a kind of people you're not that familiar with you may or you may not recognize them uh, but you know immediately whether or not they belong to your tribe let's say the tribe is the 1500 layer because of the way they plait their hair or the tattoos they have on their faces or you know the uh, patterns they have on their parkas a classic one from from the um uh, uh, uh north of canada <laughs> In particular, um, you know, the the you know, it identifies your 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 community. You just go, ah, oh, okay, I know who you are. Um, we can sit down and have a beer together. Um, uh, and those kind of things allow, if you like, their distance cues that simply allow us to go right. I know who you are. I, you believe the same stuff as I do. Uh, I can trust you. At least I know how far I can trust you. And that may be zero, <laughs> in fact, but. <laughs> <laughs> but we know where we we know where we are, uh, and we you know we already now have a basis for 
um, a relationship. So one of the interesting things we found was that actually the best predictor that people viewed, so this is their, their perception uh, 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 of somebody, a, a complete stranger, is whether or not they have the same musical taste. If they have the same musical taste, they think uh, that's a very, very strong indicator that they would make a good friend. And they're prepared to be altruistic towards somebody, you know. So that's, uh, why that should be is an interesting question. But it came ahead of pretty much every way ahead, really, of everything else. Um, but you also mentioned the the digital media, and the digital media certainly all our research, and I think everybody, pretty much everybody else is that's looked at this, suggests that well, I kind of describe it as good sticking plaster. Right? When you can't walk around round the, down the road, knock on somebody's door and say let's go and have a beer together or whatever um let's go out fishing or whatever it is you do um then you know clearly the digital media and that begins with the telephone frankly um you know we've this stuff has been around for you know a century well it started with letter writing i guess many centuries before <laughs> um all these th things help to bridge the distance so what would normally happen is if your friend moves away and we can show this with our data the quality, the emotional quality of your friendships decline uh, very steadily and inevitably and sh uh, you know, unavoidably. Um, and you have to put in the effort to contact them in order to stop that happening. So what digital media are doing very nicely and do it very efficiently is, is slow that decay, rate of decay down. But all our evidence suggests that nothing on God's earth is going to prevent that friendship eventually drifting down to just being an acquaintanceship. In other words, somebody you once knew, but you haven't seen for ages, and you can't really remember that much about them, and you might even have forgotten one of their names. Um, if you don't, in the end, meet up from time to time, you know, to to, to reinforce the relationship. So, um, uh, 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 you know, there's something visceral and special about seeing somebody in the flesh or being able to stare into the whites of their eyes across the table as it were and reach out and give them a pat on the back or a hug or whatever. Um, there's something that really makes a difference. And now, okay, you, you can have lightweight relationships, friendships, if you like, that don't require so much investment, but they are way out on, on the outer reaches of your 150 and sort of teetering on the edges that barrier, not barrier, but junction between the sort of just friends in the 150 layer to acquaintances in the layer that runs out to 500. Awesome. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I want to take in uh, Laura Cast. I think that's how you pronounce your name. Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Robin, for being here. It's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the layers. Um, I'm a tech researcher and I study, among other things, small groups. And so I have kind of a whimsical question for you, which is, uh, you know, a lot of the talk about Dunbar's number seems to come up when people are talking about social medias and Facebooks and things like that. I'm curious, if you were going to create a social media, um, what would, what do you think would make it successful or better or um, fit our needs more as a people? Well, well, well. The, the first issue here is you're talking to somebody who was born before the dinosaurs went extinct. So, you know, social media, what is that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not even on Facebook. They won't even let me on. <laughs> um, so, but I, I, I have laid down this challenge to the, to the techies, as it were, that, and, and it's this, that, you know, basically all the mechanisms that underpin our friendship. So, so there's two different things that we kind of need to keep separate. One is about friendships and relationships. And it, by friends here, we include family relationships. You know, uh, it's, it's family and friends, really. Um, and, and that's very different to the kind, many of the kind of casual relationships we have. So this is the difference, if you like, between uh, Facebook and Twitter. You know, Facebook is meant to try and keep up with with your group of friends that you had twitter is a bit more like um uh, uh you know lighthouses flashing away in the dark and who cares if the ship's sailing by or not it's irrelevant really 
um, uh, th so it's, it, it's, it's less designed to be and intended to be less personal. Of course, a lot of the other media are, are, are in the same kind of line of business, as it were. They're more broadcast. There's an anonymized broadcasting. Um, so there are two different things. What I'm concerned about is the kind of more Facebook sort of personalized relationships. Now, I think what is missing from that and will make a big difference is the in just figuring out how to solve the problem of virtual touch because all our bonding mechanisms, including the, the um, uh, virtual ones that we use, things like laughter and, and singing and, and, and uh, dancing and, and telling emotional stories and feasting together and all these kind of things, um, all trigger this touch-based endorphin system directly or indirectly, and they work much better it's very clear and people have tried this on zoom under lockdown and and you know they got a bit bored with it after <laughs> the first three or four occasions um so I, i've always challenged them by saying that look if whichever techie can invent or solve the problem of virtual touch online not only will they get the next nobel peace prize but they'll actually deserve it so there's my challenge <laughs> I don't know how to solve it, but I've seen some really, I mean, it is amazing the, the kinds of virtual attempts to solve it. People have been trying to solve it for a very long time um, and it hasn't really worked yet because there's something very visceral about real skin to skin touch, which, you know, and we don't, you know, that's, that's about close relationships. You know, we don't go around touching strangers, especially not in Britain, for heaven's sakes. Um, <laughs> you Canadians can if you want, but. <laughs> Um, but actually, you know, even here, it turns out we've sampled this all around Europe and in Japan, and, and the patterns are pretty much identical right the way across Europe. Okay, the Italians are a bit more effusive and touchy-feely than the British are, but, you know, the patterns you see are very similar. We don't really go around kind of um, uh, uh, manhandling uh, people who are beyond our 50 circle. That's probably the limit at which we kind of engage in hugging and caressing and patting on the shoulder and all these kind of things. You know, what happens out beyond that is handshakes only, guys. I'm right. curious. Um, so that's really, really interesting. And I'm very intrigued. And I'm curious, um, when you think about, say, the work of, of Harlow on the baby yeah. monkeys, it, it seems like it's almost the embodiment um, doesn't have to be, in fact, another person or um, that it's act, you know, it, it could be a an okay representation as yep. long as the feelings yep. are there. Yep. Yes, yes, I, I, but that goes back to the nature of social networks too. Your 150 circle of friends and family, normally, that's filled pretty much by you know real standing up people, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why you can't have your you know long dead an ancestors in there more recent ones presumably um uh, rather than you know that you've actually known there's no reason why you can't have your uh pet chihuahua or your pet horse your favorite horse in there um there's no reason why you can't have your favorite uh tv soap um character for if, if you happen to be deeply in, engaged with that there's absolutely no reason at all why you can't have completely virtual characters or, or uh, individuals, if you like, in there, in the form of God, or the saints, or the Virgin Mary, or whatever other um, uh, people in the spirit world in heaven, or wherever they, they are, uh, according to your religion, you know, the key is, do you think you have a relationship with them? Do you have meaningful conversations with them? And, you know, do you think they converse with you in some sort of form, or, or have some reciprocated relationship with you. It's having, it's this sense of having a reciprocated relationship um, that's important. And, and you know, uh, you can fill your 150 slots up with anybody you like, really. Um, I, you know, um, Prince Charles used to talk to his roses, as I recall, uh, uh, in his gardens, at whichever palace he lives in. And I, I figure that. Um, you know, uh, you can have your favorite potty plants as well. Awesome. 
Thank you, Laura. Um, Anjan, you had a question. Hey, Robin, I think I'll just read out my question because I'm too excited and I'll go on for too long. Uh, my question is, if my phone and Evernote and contacts apps um, are an extension of my brain, uh, where did that go? Sorry, the chat keeps moving it. Uh, well, I guess I'll just ask it. Yeah, if all these things I use on my phone are an extension of my brain, I don't remember numbers anymore. If somebody asks something, I might be so bold in a conversation, take my phone and I'll be like, wait one second and try to find it in my Evernote. Um, how does that change uh, the Dunbar number? And I think maybe the second kind of question in there is, is the Dunbar number about more than just memory? Have we kind of reduced it to, oh, it's just about storage retrieval? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, or good two questions, actually. Um, I, I think the short answer to that is, every attempt to look at whether people have more friends online uh, than they have offline has suggested the answer is no, they're the same. You have the same people online as you have offline. Um, uh, there was one um, analysis of a million uh, Facebook pages, so just the number of friends on Facebook that was done well, probably a decade ago now, I oh, it won't be that long ago, um, some years ago anyway. And uh, what you had, I mean, okay, I mean, this is the interesting uh, test, if you like, because Facebook or digital media in general, social media, if you like, the, the, the message on the tin can, the advertising on the tin can said, you know, we're going to allow you to increase the size of your social circle. Uh, you know, infinitely uh, and all around the world, you know, um, which incidentally was the same, same promise, promissory note that was made on the tin can for email when that first came out a decade earlier. But uh, the answer is it doesn't seem to happen. You know, you, okay, you can have anything between zero and 5,000 friends on Facebook. Facebook puts that limit on or put that limit on, I guess, for just technical reasons. But, and then there are a few people that have, you know, a thousand, maybe even 2,000 friends on Facebook, but the bulk of people, and this was a huge, huge sample, um, had between about 150 and 250, which is kind of about where you'd expect it to be for the age range of people that are the main users. So late teens, early 20s, first up to about 25 or so, people tend to have pushing 250 friends, um, and then it sort of comes down towards 150, stabilizes in the 30s. And, and, and then after this sort of about 65, 70, it declines. So you get this average across across the age of ages of people in, in of about 150, but actually it's a, an inverted U-shaped curve. You, know, you start out in life um, with one and a half friends, it seems, the innermost circle is at one and a half. Um, what that says about fathers, I don't know, because presumably mum is there, <laughs> must be one, and the half must be uh, the fathers, and then it sort of steadily increases, hits this peak at, in, the, in the late teens, early 20s, and then sort of stabilizes and then declines again. You end up, if you live long enough, back up one and a half, it seems. There's lots and lots of evidence now to, sh to show, show the consistency of this pattern. Um, we've looked at number of friends on Facebook um, in several different studies, um, one of two of which have been national surveys in Britain, um, and they all show pretty much the same thing. Now, what you would need to do is to look at the structure of postings on Facebook. If you do that, you just see the layers at 5, 15, 50, 150, 500, beautifully laid out before you. It's, uh, absolutely extraordinary. You even see the same frequencies of contact on Facebook and on the telephone. You see it in telephone databases, cell phone databases as well. You see the same layers, each layer with the same frequency of contact that you see in face-to-face -face contact in real life. So yes, you know, you can have, you know, you can befriend anybody you like on Facebook and, and push your numbers up and it becomes a bit of a game. Um, but if you look at how meaningful those relationships are for you. It's a very different picture. You know, you have your core, core social network, but mostly the people you see in, in real life anyway. You, know, you see this on the phone. phone. I mean, the people you phone most often are not the people you see less often in real life. They're actually the people you see 
most often <laughs> you phone them most often you text them most often you uh, facebook them or whatever instagram them or whatever uh most often too so these are just functioning as different ways of, of keeping contact and after all that ramble i've forgotten what your second question was because it was particularly interesting and i was kind of leading around to it so just remind me yeah it, implicit in kind of the question whether this exocortex of technology helps us because oh, right. it gets bigger yes, memory. bigger memory Okay. Like it seems so, I've just implicitly assumed Dunbar number is just about memory. How many people can I remember? What was their favorite color? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, the, and, and that's really uh, the important issue here because, and that's, I, I, I mean, I think the burden of everything I was just saying is that your, the size of your social circle, both on Facebook and off Facebook are identical because the constraint is not in the, mode of communication which is what facebook allows you to kind of post to everybody if you like in the world at the same time and that clearly isn't forming uh some the constraint it's not in the memory component because the only point in which that starts to be an issue is around the 1500 5000 layers where it becomes a pure memory problem um uh, uh, the, for, the, for the kind of inner circles, which kind of remain stable despite, at 150, despite the um, facilities of the technology, it's the constraint is in your mind. You just cannot maintain and manage relationships with more than that number. And it, it's not so much keeping track of them, it's being able to understand them well enough that you know how and why they think what they do and behave in the way they do, that you can kind of <clears throat> predict their behavior well enough to be able to, um, you know, sort of interact with them. And, and if you ask them to do a favor, you know, you know whether they're going to say yes or no, basically. So it's actually understanding how they think. And that's really, A, that's very hard work for the brain. It's, it, and we've shown with neuro, neuroimaging experiments that, when you're kind of doing this kind of mentalizing, as it's usually called, trying to think through, model somebody else's thinking processes, their, you know, how they view the world, then uh, you're using up far more uh, neural processing power than if you're just trying to remember the sheer facts of the relationship that's, that's involved and, and, and the physical facts of what they might be doing or something like that. So it's this, it <clears throat> seems to be this kind of, internal modeling that we do of how the other people's minds work that really in the end imposes the limit. If you don't mind me sneaking in just a quick follow up. <laughs> um, uh, Pete, oh, you know, we're in Peter's hands here, you know, and he's silent, he's been switched off. So go ahead. Um, oh, he has switched himself off. <laughs> so that's quite interesting that it's the modeling of the other person that is the cognitively demanding parts of it. If, if on a spectrum, like on one side, you have somebody with autism or Asperger's where it's exceedingly hard, and I'm not exactly sure who would be on the other side of the spectrum, maybe Peter Lindbergh. Um, uh, has, there been, has there been research you found exciting that kind of helps elucidate uh, maybe some of those mechanisms that would explain uh, the spectrum? That's a very interesting question, actually, and it's not really been looked at. I keep kind of uh, poking people, if you like, to um, have a look at this and see whether um, uh, people on, uh, 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 on the autistic spectrum um, have fewer friends because what defines full-blooded autism um, and, and to some extent um, uh, uh, Asperger syndrome as well is the inability to mentalize, to understand the motivations, if you like, the, the intentions of another individual by being able to kind of get inside their mind and see the world for, from their point of view. So that ought to mean, since we can show with, with normal adults, if you like, at least, we haven't looked at it developmentally, which would be the other interesting thing to do because children 
develop their mentalizing skills through time, it kind of unfolds in a kind of almost a Piagetian way, it seems. Um, but certainly with adults, we've shown that people, and, and adults vary in their mentalizing skills. I mean, the, the average is, we consistently find is fifth order intentionality for normal adults, which means you can handle four other people's mind states at the same time as your own. You know, I think that Susie wonders whether Jim is intending to uh, speak to Billy uh, about Billy's um, uh, intentions to do something else. You know, you can handle all those at, at one, one time. Now, now, the number of mind states you can handle simultaneously is highly correlated with the number of close friends you have. Um, and looks like, and it also limits the size of our conversation groups. There's a very, very strict limit on the number of people that can be in a conversation at the same time at about four. Um, uh, uh, and we kind of interpret that as, you know, since a lot of conversations about somebody not present and their mind state, there's your fifth limit. <laughs> but it, this seems, this is such a regular thing. I mean, you can just see it happening in front of your eyes if you go to a, a a party we're not a raucous party because nobody can hear anybody else but you know a reception or something like that you know if you look at the the, the size of conversation groups people drift in and out um uh, very fast you know if, if you get more than four people in the conversation uh, it, it, it'll just break up into to smaller groups um so so these kind of uh, abilities are, are really fundamental to handling relationships and i don't know how you get over that problem I, i'm not aware of um but there was somebody who was going to sample uh asperger's individuals because they were in a uh, asperger's um I don't know, a virtual association or something like that but i haven't heard any any more about that um but the the um uh, it, it ought to mean their social world is smaller um, particularly as you get more and more extreme. Uh, Asperger's uh, people um, have the advantage that very often they're higher than average IQ, which means what they do is they're very good, good at kind of learning, uh, if you like, um, uh, rules of behavior. So they can, they can wing it without uh, necessarily having to um, um, do the hard work of uh, of understanding the mind states, they can kind of do it on the basis of rules of engagement of, of behavior, um, which they've kind of you know, just just through practice and observation in the course of life. And so so they could, but, but very often they get kind of get unstuck, which then makes them very uncomfortable um, when something happens, which is kind of out of the norm and doesn't fit any of their rules. You know, they, they get very bothered at that point. Whereas a, a kind of neurotypical person, as they usually called, um, will, will kind of go, that's because, you know, can figure out what's going on here, you know, why they're behaving so badly. So, um, um, you know, so yes, uh, but as I say, it would be very, it would be a very nice test case. Um, we think, you know, the date, the data we've, uh, studies we've already done on, on kind of the normal population, um, points us in the direction which, which, which it would be, uh, what the, where the answer would be, but it would be really interesting to have it done properly. But, I mean, the problem is you can't, you know, once you get into full-blown autism, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, you know, we have to ask people, you know, who's your friend? <laughs> and if their language isn't very good, uh, um, which is what happens obviously in full-blown autism, then this is, this is, um, uh, not easy to do. I mean, I suppose you can go around. We have done this with kids, um, uh, you know, sort of watch them in the playground and figured out how many kids they play with and at any one time and, and you know, sort of observationally extract their friendships, which um, and that's um, uh, one way of doing it. But, you know, it's, that's also much harder work. It's much easier to ask people just to write a list <laughs> or to get the get their cell phone <laughs> calling, calling data. <laughs> Awesome. Sorry, Peter, we, we better. Uh, thanks, uh, Anjan. Um, we'll have uh, time for probably one more question. Um, I'm going to risk putting him on the spot. Uh, Dave Snowden, uh, I know you wrote about Robin Dunbar in the past. Do you, any, any questions or thoughts that you'd like to uh, share? <laughs> 
you, you could pass if, if you want. Um, yeah, you're, you're lining me up for my session later. Hi, Robin. Um, I actually met once at the Liverpool Complexity Conference, but that's going back some. Um, some of the work we've been doing is to use Dunbar, the various range of Dunbar numbers on identities rather than individuals. So looking at identities as sort of clan or tribal type links. Yep. Yeah. And I was fascinated on the 5000 because I speculated on that in Singapore about 12 years ago. And so I think there's a natural limit on societies of 5000 after which they lose cultural coherence. Yes. And that was based on looking at Australian states and, you know, Scandinavian countries. Yes. And we were saying to Singapore, don't go to 7000 because you'll get race riots and lo and, the, lo and behold, they did. So yes. the identity, I think, is the thing we're really interested in is, is yes. certainly on the internet. People seem to, and people seem to be able to be in several identities and then the identities seem to have relationships with each other. Yes, and this is, this is, been shown you get the same circles with the same numbers on um, uh, MOMs, uh, uh, you know, internet gaming worlds, mm. um, where you're dealing with strangers, or you're dealing with avatars, I suppose, everybody's got an avatar in the game. But you see this exactly the same, same pattern. But I think you're right. I mean, this is, this is sort of back to the issue of how have we managed to scale up from these very, very small scale hunter gatherer type communities and tribes, you know, tribal size is, is, is really, average is somewhere around about 1500. How have we managed to scale up once we started living in, in permanent villages to have these huge conurbations and, and mega communities that we these days call, you know, the state, uh, of the nation state or, or uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the answer is, you know, I think we've done it by kind of exploiting the cultural components that came in with modern humans early on through language because they create this sense of identity or belonging through identity. So this is what I sometimes refer to as the uh, totem pole in the center of the village green. You know, that we all recognize what the criteria are for membership and, and, and um, you know, they can be many and varied. There's, there's no restriction at that point. It um, allowed me to do that. If I can throw in a supplementary, we're currently doing a project on peace and reconciliation in the States um, post the election. Right. So we're looking at how do you break down red and blue tribal identities? Yeah. And the way we're doing that is distributed ethnography. So we're getting young people to be ethnographers into their communities to identify narrative patterns. And then we're looking at narratives which are interpreted the same way by red and blue. Right. And then getting people from both communities to work on those narratives and not talk about the politics. Right. The attempt there is to sort of disrupt the identity structures, which, which are almost like an assemblage structure to go back to loose, yes. so packing people in. So to yes. disrupt those through action, not through conversation. And I'm, what, what, um, any insight on that would be appreciated because we're up to our necks in it at the moment. <laughs> uh, that sounds really exciting, actually, because I, I'm sure that's along the right lines. I mean, it, it, this goes back to the fact that uh, if you want to bond large numbers of individuals, I mean, you can kind of do it in two ways. One is, if you like, by triggering the endorphin system in some way, which is what we do on football terraces. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, uh, for, for the for the benefit of the Americans, I mean soccer, not football. <laughs> but you and I understood that, um, uh, uh, you know. And, and you know the the songs you all sing together with these complete strangers. It creates this intense form of bonding. So these physical activities, dancing, and I, I often wonder how big a line dance could you get, guys. Uh, everybody falls apart when I always mention line dancing because I said that's not real dancing, but there is a sense in which it's the synchrony of, of the action that causes the bonding. Yeah. Uh, the question is how long a line dance can you have before the ends get so out of timing with each other that it's not working, um, which is why singing seems to work really well. It, it scales up um, extremely well. Um, 
religious religious the rituals of religions seem to have captured the essence of this so they're very all of these are very focused um but very act, kind of activity driven and and it creates this sense of of, of bubbling up of warmth and because the endorphin effect you know warmth and coziness and relaxation and calmness and peace with the world and you know and that's what actually creates the bonds um now the alternative way of doing it is is to the kind of cognitive stroke cultural level of, of having the same stories ancestor stories or origin stories or you know the, the, we all know the same folk tales kind of thing um you know but that's that i, I think that those those cognitive ones are really proxies they allow you to recognize somebody who is probably okay at a distance. But if you engage in these physical activities with them, uh, that creates real bonds of friendship very fast. You can turn complete strangers mm. into lifelong buddies who've known each other forever uh, with just an hour's community singing together. Um, how, you, how you get the entire you know, uh, United States into one communal sing song I, is I leave to you. There are blessings to being in Canada, you know, small scale. <laughs> I'm, I'm Welsh, we're very good at choral singing. Right? Exactly so, exactly so. Yes, you should know all about it. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. We, it, 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 all, we've done a lot of studies and experiments on singing because it's kind of easy to do and we just, amazed how well it works we call it the icebreaker effect because it literally is instantaneous um, but i think you're kind of heading in the right direction is is you know you want to build build on the things that are held in common not the things that aren't held in common that would be my view but i this is a grand experiment on your part so a um well done for trying it and b i should just be fascinated to see what the outcome is Okay. We'll, we'll uh, this, goes, this goes back to the, the gen, generic problem of, you know, as the country gets bigger and bigger, it's easy, much easier for it to fall into these kind of divisive traps, if you like. And, and it, in the end, all empires fall apart, you know, the USSR being the case in point. Uh, and the one that hasn't yet is the United States. And, you know, we're all sitting around wondering how long it is before Alabama declares UDI is... Uh, um, uh, um, the famous saying goes, um, you know, it's it's amazing. And I think it's because, well, there are lots of reasons, but I th I'm sure part of it is the kind of pledging the allegiance every morning at school just creates a sense of unity. Um, but, you know, this is, this is not going to last forever. At some point, the US's population size is going to be so large, that people at California, you know, start lobbying. <laughs> Uh, paper darts at the people on the East Coast. Beautiful. Thank you, uh, Dave. Um, so we reached the top of the hour. Uh, before I uh, make closing announcements, uh, Robin, any, any kind of closing summarizing thoughts uh, that you'd like to leave us with today? Uh, um, I, I, I think all I will say is we often forget how important friendships are for us. You know, and what is always staggered me, and we've only known this for really no more than 10 or 15 years, but there's been this tsunami of epidemiological evidence now that the single most important factor affecting your psychological health and well-being, your physical health and well-being, even how long you live into the future from now, as it were, is predicted by one thing and one thing only, and that is the number of close friendships you have. Um, you know, so friendships are important, guys. Get out there, <laughs> talk to them. <laughs> Go dancing when you're allowed. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so I'll make some um, announcements in a moment. But Robin, thank you so much for coming to Stoa today. Uh, love to have Great you. Great pleasure. Um, Great pleasure. So to plug um, the next session, Dave, if I can put you <laughs> on the spot again, <laughs> your, your session coming up, I think on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern time, intuition and anticipation and navigating complexity. Would you like to um, kind of briefly uh, hint at what that that's going to entail? Probably looking at, at two pairs of things. One is the way that affordances and assemblages 
um, control not only what so it's like the affordance is the biological concept of what's available to you an assemblage is a structure which actually prevents you seeing things you might otherwise see yeah um, and that but it's got strength as well they don't arise anyway and the other one is constraints and constructors so we've been doing a lot of work lately taking constructor theory from physics and starting to look at how that applies to social systems so in, in constructor theory and physics is a constructor is something which achieves change without changing itself and links into substrates. So you're going to get the first outing of um, that particular set. It's, it's all based on what I did last time. It's a focus of what you can manage in a complex system. And you can only manage the present and the, the direction of travel or the lines of flight as Deleuze called it. Uh, you can't manage to outcome. So that, that's what I'll be exploring. And I'm super excited uh, about that session. I've been mentioning your work like almost every day in my coaching practice. So um, I'm geeking out about this. And uh, we have a big event coming up at the end of June, the future of the left. Uh, Noam Chomsky is returning back to the STOA and is going to have a conversation with Natalie Wynn, ContraPoints. So that should be uh, uh, quite special for Patreon uh, only. Um, so yeah, everyone, thank you so much for supporting us via Patreon. This is a Patreon event. Uh, and Robin, thanks again for coming to the STOA today. Great pleasure. Thank you.